Hi everyone, Mike from the Excel Trainer here. Convert your list based data into a table and magic things will happen. If you want to follow along, you can download a copy of the demo file from the link in the description below. OK, first things first, what do I mean by a table? Well, if we look at the data on the left in columns A to E, it looks like a table to me. It's data structured in rows and columns. It has headings across the first row. Most people would describe it as a table. But in Excel, a table doesn't just refer to the way data is structured. If you compare the data in columns A to E with the data in columns I to M, there's one tiny difference. At the bottom right hand corner of M28, there's a tiny blue marker. This is the end of table marker. So that's how we know that the data in I1 to M28 is a table and A1 to E28 isn't. But if there were hundreds of rows, you wouldn't want to scroll down to the end of the list to discover if your list was a real table or just a list that was structured to look like a table. The simplest way to check is to click into the data anywhere will do. And if the table design tab appears on the ribbon, it's a real Excel table. If there's no table design tab on the ribbon, then it's not a table. Now, if I go back into the table and click on the table design tab on the ribbon and look on the left hand side of the ribbon, you'll see a table name. When a table is created, Excel assigns it a name. The default name is table and a number. So, for example, table one. You can leave the table name as it is, but most people rename the table to something more sensible. A lot of people, myself included, start the table name with TBL. And that way, if you go to the formulas tab and open up the name manager, you can immediately see which names are your table names and which are ordinary cell or range names. So how do you convert a list into a table? Well, I'll come on to that shortly, but first I want to show you some of the benefits of using real Excel tables. Before I do, when you create a table, Excel applies some formatting to it, shading alternate rows to make it easier to read and automatically adding filter buttons on the heading row. But it's not this that makes it a table. These two tables look identical. But columns I to M is a real Excel table. You can see that because the table tab appears in the ribbon. But columns A to E aren't. These cells have been manually formatted and the filter buttons have been manually added. The biggest benefit of a table is that as more data is added, the table automatically resizes. Now, to save time, I'm not going to type more data. I'll copy and paste it. Before I do, up in column P, there are two formulas, and both of those formulas are adding up the annual salaries. One is adding up the salaries in column E. The other is adding up the salaries in column M. So let's start with the data in columns A to E, which isn't a table. I'll select the data on row 28, copy and paste it. And what it's done is it's not updated the formula, but it has put a little marker against P1. And if I click onto P1 and click on the warning symbol, I get an option to update the formula to include the cells. So I will choose that. And it's now updated the formula to include E2 through to E29. I'll do the same thing now, but this time I will copy the data that's in columns I to M and paste that on the row below. And automatically the little blue marker has moved to row 29. It was on row 28, but the formula in P2 has updated automatically. Now, if I go to P2, the formula 
is slightly different. The one in P1 is a traditional formula, sum or add up what's in E2 to E29. But the one in P2 says sum or add up the data that's in the annual salary column from the table called TBL employees three. If I click anywhere in this data, go up to the table design menu, you can see the table is called TBL employees three. And when you have a table, the top row is normally treated as column headings. So the formula is adding up the numbers from the annual salary column in that named table. And the benefit of doing it that way is that as you add more rows of data, because the table automatically expands, the formula updates. Now here we have two pivot tables that are both based on the table called TBL employees four and TBL employees four is the table that's in A1 through to E28. If I click into the first pivot table and click on analyze change data source, it shows me that the data source for that pivot table is the table in A1 to E28. And the same for the second pivot table, analyze change data source. And the data source for that pivot table is exactly the same. So you can see the little blue marker is in E28. I'm going to select some data. I'll just select three rows this time, copy and paste. The table has automatically resized, but the pivot tables have not updated. So even though the pivot tables are linked to a table and the table automatically resizes, the pivot tables do need to be refreshed. So I'll click data, refresh all. That has updated both pivot tables. So you still have to refresh, but at least by having the pivot table source as a table, you don't have to change the data source of the pivot table every time you add a new row of data. Now the data in rows four to 10 is not a table. I can click into it and there is no table menu, but the data in rows 13 to 19 is again, I'll click into it. You've got the marker at the bottom. You've got the table design menu. And if I go and add July and say 40,000, it has not updated the chart. What I'd have to do is select the chart, go to chart design, select data, and then change the data source to go from A4 to B11. And that has now included July. But if I create a chart from this table, the chart will automatically update as I add new data. I don't have to select the entire table. I can, but it's an unnecessary step. So I'll just click anywhere in that table, go up to insert, choose the type of chart I want and just uh, move it and resize it. And then if I go and add July's data to the bottom of the table, as soon as I do, it adds July to the chart and I'll add in a number and it adds a bar for July. So there's another benefit of having your data in a table. If you're building a chart from that data, the chart automatically updates. If I'd added extra columns, by the way, then that will increase the size of the table as well. It's not just adding extra rows. Another benefit of tables is when working with formulas. So if I go up to F2, I need to calculate here the monthly salary for each employee. So I'll just type in a simple formula E2 divided by 12. It gives me the value. I just need to copy it down. I can format it as currency, but I won't just to save a little bit of time. But the point there is I typed in the formula once, copied it down. If I was to add some more employees, 
I would have to then copy that formula down myself so I get the monthly salary for those other employees. However, if the data is in a table, I'll go and add a heading into N1 of monthly salary. And what it's now done is it's now increased the table to go from I to N. As I said in the previous example, if you add extra columns, it also changes the size of the table. Then I'll go to N2 and type in a formula which says M2 divided by 12 and press enter. And what that does is it copies the formula down automatically. Now, if you didn't want the formula copied down automatically, all you have to do is undo and it takes you back to just that formula. I'm actually going to delete that formula and show you a different way to enter a formula in when you're referencing a table. So instead of typing M2, if I click on M2, it puts the formula in slightly differently. I'll just finish it off with a divided by 12. It's used the column name. So remember, when you have a table, the first row is treated as column headings. It's used the column heading and the at sign, which again, it put in automatically, means this row. So what we're saying is the number in the annual salary column for this row divided by 12. Again, it automatically copies the formula down. And this time when I add my new employees underneath, it automatically copies the formula down in column N without me having to do anything. Now, here's a small but useful benefit of a table. This data is actually in a list. It's not in a table. And as I scroll down the spreadsheet, the headings from row one disappear. I'm sure you're used to seeing that. And the problem is we then don't know what data relates to what column heading. I can, of course, use freeze panes to stop that happening. I can select row two, go to view, freeze panes, freeze panes. And now as I scroll down the spreadsheet, row one remains on screen all the time. But with a table, as you scroll down, as long as when you scroll, the cursor is in a cell within the table, the column letters are automatically replaced by the table headings. As I say, it's just a small point, but it's a useful one. Finally, before I show you how to create a table, you can attach a slicer to a table. Many people think that slicers can only be attached to pivot tables, but that's not true. This slicer is attached to the table called TBL Employees 7, which is this table here that goes from column A to E. So what I've done here is I have created a slicer which allows me to filter by department. I've also added a couple of formulas. So as I click the buttons on the slicer, you can see that it's applying a filter and it's updating the numbers in H1 and K1. The benefit of using a slicer rather than the built-in filter buttons at the top of the column headings is that the slicer looks nicer and can be positioned anywhere whereas the filter buttons are always in the header cells. To generate the total salary and the headcount, by the way, I've used the subtotal function. And the subtotal function takes into account any filtering that's been applied, whereas sum and count don't. But as you can see, the formulas both reference the table and a column within that table. OK, so that's how tables work. But how do you create one? Well, here I want to convert this data, which looks like a table but isn't, into a table. So I click into one cell within that data and I can either click on insert table or I can use the keyboard shortcut control and T. It should automatically pick up the correct range. So it's selected A1 to E50. 
It's also put a tick in the box that says my table has headers. Usually Excel can recognize the headers, but sometimes that box is empty. So make sure there is a tick in that box. Otherwise, you're going to get headings that are column one, column two, column three and so on. So once I've done that, I'll click on OK. And it's now created a table. It's named the table table nine. I can just change that by over typing what's in the name box. I can also change the format. So if you don't like the default shading it's created, you can click the drop down to the right of the table styles and either choose a different style or create your own style or just click clear and that clears the formatting completely. And if you want to turn off or hide the drop downs that it's added to the header row, go up to the table design menu and take the tick out of filter button. Now, let's say I wanted to create a pivot table from that data. As long as I click anywhere in that table and go to insert pivot table, it picks up automatically the name of the table and assumes that you want to use that as the source data for the pivot table. And if you want to add a slicer to the table, click on table design, insert slicer, choose the column that you want to have the slicer associated with and click OK. So that's how to create and use tables in Excel. If you found this video useful, please give it a like. And if you're not already subscribed, please consider subscribing to the channel. If you have any suggestions for future videos, please let me know in the comments. My free weekly newsletter is packed with tips to help you become more productive in Excel. And you can sign up to that at theexceltrainer.co.uk. But until the next time, have an excellent day.